Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holichak, philosopher, historian, Thomas Jefferson scholar. And today I'd like to talk about what I call the fallacy of swamping, or subtitled The Artful Dodging and Moral Scurrility of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Socrates was, we all know, one of the most controversial and perhaps one of the most beloved figures in human history. It's well known also that he was late in life charged with numerous crimes, most of which were subsumable under the charge of corrupting the young by inciting them and through discussion uh, to question the social, the political, and even the ethical dogmatism in late 5th century Athens. Socrates faced, because of his charges, a jury of some 500 Athenians. And um, he know, we know he was sentenced to death, but he certainly probably would have been given a, a lesser punishment had he merely apologized for his zetetic manner of living. But he refused to do so. He was so into uh, truth as a manner of living and, and uh, trying to discover the, the various virtues that uh, he could not live a lie. And because of his refusal to apologize, he was awarded the death sentence. Now, prior to his death, he was in the Athenian prison for a large number of days, where he was often visited by his wife, uh, the loved ones, and friends. Uh, the friends, clearly, we know from Plato's Credo, uh, encouraged him often to try and escape. Plato, Plato gives an instance where Credo himself comes in and offers a, a variety, a barrage of arguments for Socrates' escape. And, and Plato lists them almost in machine-like fashion. Plato limbs these as follows. I shall lose a friend whom I can never replace if you die, says Credo. I shall be disgraced in the eyes of others, for many will think I'm unwilling to spend money to save you if you die. Three, no harm will come to us if we help you escape. Four, there is money enough for you to escape. In other words, the, the guards can be readily bribed. Five, men will love you in other places if you escape. The sentiment being that Socrates can practice his dialectic uh, wherever he goes. And uh, he will be loved by the people there. Six, you are playing at the hands of your enemies by willingly going to your death. Seven, you, profess, you, you are betraying your children by refusing to escape. Eight, you profess virtue in all actions, yet you choose the easiest, in other words, the non-virtuous path, by willingly going to your death. And last, Credo says, you will bring shame upon yourself and us by not escaping. Socrates dismisses most of what Credo has to say as being opinions based on the majority, the opinions of the majority, who uh, and the majority always thought lacked reason and uh, did their persuading through uh, coercive means or mellifluous words and not by rationality. Socrates was convinced only the opinions of the wise ought to be valued. He sums, and I quote, the only valid consideration, he tells Credo, is whether we should be acting rightly in giving money and gratitude to those who will lead me out of here and are self-helping with the escape, or whether in truth we shall do wrong in doing all this. Now, in effect, uh, Socrates says that only reason eight uh, deserves consideration. In other words, whether it's right for him to escape when Athenians that have voted that he should go to his death. Um, his own life is of no importance to him, but it's not life for Socrates, but the good life that is most desirable. And for Socrates, the good life, the beautiful life, and the just life are one and the same. So what does this all have to do with Thomas Jefferson? Why the lengthy prefatory account? Well, my focus here uh, in talking about the Credo is not logic, uh, and excuse me, is logic, but not ethics. I'm not con concerned with the ethical points that Plato's trying to make, but with a logical point. Now, logic, when one has a strong argument in support of a claim, there's sufficient reason for it, and one is rationally warranted to believe that the claim is true. There's, there are no need for, uh, there's no need for auxiliary arguments. Right. Consider, for example, um, a simple claim that 
all the ales in a certain refrigerator are stouts. Now, Valerie questions that claim, wants to know whether it's true. She asks her brother, and her brother Victor says, uh, well, I just now placed six stouts in the fridge, which was, um, when I carefully looked around, completely empty outside of the stouts. Now, Valerie then opens the refrigerator to check her brother's assertion and declares, well, you're right, there's nothing else in the fridge but the stouts, all the ales in the fridge are stouts. Now, here the evidence is sufficient for believing the claim all the ales in the refrigerators are stouts is true. Evidence like um, younger brother Vaughn noticing an empty Guinness six-pack container in the recycling bin is unavailing, not necessary. Unless it's the case that Victor and Valeria are notorious liars, one would think someone strange who looked for auxiliary evidence to support the claim. Now, in a recent decree, which I title the Manifesto of 2018, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation has stated flatly that Thomas Jefferson is the father of Eston Hemings and Sally Hemings' five other children. In that manifesto, the foundation gives 10 arguments for Jefferson's paternity. I address those arguments fully in a forthcoming editorial titled the Manifesto of 2008 and the Hypocrisy of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Finally Exposed, as well as some of you have already seen a video in my Thomas Jefferson Facebook page. And that page is Thomas Jefferson, Bring Him Home to Monticello. You can find the video there. It's also on YouTube. What is strange is that those are the same arguments. Those 10 arguments are the same arguments that the foundation decided in 2000 showed that Jefferson was only very likely the father of Eston Hemings and likely the father of the other five children. I can only say at this point how mercurial are members of the foundation when it comes to logical assessment, right? But examination of those 10 arguments shows plainly that not one of the arguments is sufficiently cogent to show Jefferson's paternity and that some of the arguments read them yourself, are laughably weak. Well, what, however, about the suggestion that all this evidence be gathered and taken together? One can't just add several weak arguments and come up with the strong arguments if the arguments are independent of each other. Uh, I, I can offer an analogy to help us understand the point I just made. Imagine seven cups of weak lavender tea and here I am, you know, in an effort to, to come up with a strong tea, pour the seven cups into a large bowl, one at a time, until I have the bowl filled with lavender tea. Now I sample from one of the empty cups the tea uh, with the expectation that the tea has been made stronger by mixing the several weak teas into the bowl. Well, of course, you know, you'd say that just makes no sense. You can't mix together weak teas and come up with a strong tea. You can add uh, another tea bag to one of the weak teas and, and uh, boil it just and come up with a stronger tea, but you can't make, mix together weak teas and come up with a strong tea. Um, weak tea added to weak tea only makes for weak tea. It's similar with weak arguments, with weak independent arguments. Can't mix them together. Now the point here is the fact that the Thomas Jefferson Foundation limbs 10 separate arguments in favor of Jefferson's paternity. Now that it's a, it in itself uh, is suspicious. It's as suspicious as Credo throwing out nine quick reasons in favor of Socrates' escape. Uh, when one has one strong argument, no other arguments are needed. This is something that was practiced uh, in antiquity and is still commonly practiced in philosophy where students and professors are encouraged to give numerous arguments for a claim and in some sense, it, it does make a lot of sense when, if I can come up with one strong argument for a claim, no other, other arguments are really needed. So what's the point of, of, of uh, gathering together other arguments and, and as if that's going to help bolster uh, the truth or give us more reason for truth and conclusion? Okay. It's also suspicious, I might add, that the Foundation has never straightforwardly addressed the scholarly arguments against Jefferson's paternity. And there are many good scholarly arguments that deserve attention. There are 
is testimony of uh, many people who were around when Jefferson lived, Edmund Bacon, for example, the overseer, uh, which is completely disregarded by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And are we supposed to disregard his testimony because he's white and because he lived when Thomas Jefferson lived and he saw much? Okay, now the members of the foundation, it seems, are discretionarily taking great and certain liberties with the life and legacy of one of the greatest American figures. On the Monticello webpage, we find all sorts of posits of Kevin's lives. And I quote, Sally Hemings bore children fathered by her owner. Again, Sally Hemings was able to negotiate with her owner in France. Again, they, Sally and brother James, lived at Jefferson's residence in the Hotel de la Gare. Now, none of those claims uh, is known to be true, and no honest morality-abiding scholar would posit them as factual. We don't know. We know next to nothing about what happened to Sally Hemings when she was in Paris. For all intents and purposes, we have every reason to believe, to believe that she stayed in the convent uh, where Jefferson's daughters were being schooled. Now, finally, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation on their webpage asked us about the Jefferson, Jefferson's relationship with Hemings. Was it rape? That's going a bit too far. Thomas Jefferson was not the sort of person who could have been capable of anything like that with a slave or with anybody else. It's time, I say, to boycott Monticello. If you want to see something about Thomas Jefferson and his life and legacy, Go to Poplar Forest. I'll be moving that pretty soon. So take it easy and talk to you later.